Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO, Expedia Group, Mark Okerstrom, in discussion with Skift Executive Editor, Founding Editor, Dennis Shaw. Hello. Hey, Mark. Hello, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm good. Well, I don't think I'll be as smart as the last guy you spoke to. Uh, we'll <laughs> see about that. The genius. <laughs> you know, we tried to buy him back. You did. But he, Dara took him. Oh, man. Yeah. Corporate raider. <laughs> so, Mark, you, uh, you appeared on this very stage. I think it was that very chair a year ago. We were very happy about that. Yep. Um, I think it was your first public appearance after becoming CEO. It was. So, uh, we're very happy to have you back. So, uh, it looks like you've been having a pretty good year. Stock's been up since the beginning of the year. Uh, company name changes are in vogue this yeah. year. Priceline Group became, um, what did they become? Booking Holdings. Yeah. You went from Expedia Inc. to Expedia Group. Yeah, big changes. What's in a name? <laughs> What's in a name? You have all these brands, okay? Yeah, you have yeah. Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity. Yeah. My girlfriend, by the way, says that Travelocity is way better than Orbitz. There you go. Um, you have Hotwire, HomeAway. So yeah. is it important to define, to yes. tightly define the, yeah. their mission? Yeah, I think, listen, the, I got some advice a long time ago, which is if you become a CEO, the first thing you should do is change the logo. <laughs> Joke. It's like the last thing you should do. But <laughs> what we had been historically uh, was really a kind of a holding investment company, and, and that deserves a corporate logo that was designed in the early 2000s and the ink at the end. But what we had become was something very different. And the direction we're going is very different, which is you know, the operation of essentially the world's travel platform. I mean, no one can take any person from any place to anywhere and give them incredible experience like we can. You know, we, uh, we operate a huge two-sided platform, and that requires a new identity. And you can't have an identity if you're an ink, but a group can have an identity. So Expedia Group was all about a cool new logo, but really about defining for ourselves, for our investors, for our partners, who we had become and who we aspired to be. Right. You know, so there's been a lot of talk about Amazon getting into travel. And the funny thing about that to me is uh, Expedia is a 20-year-old company. And this, here, this year, I hear you talking about focusing on adding hotel inventory. <laughs> you know, how's Amazon going to do that? Yeah. And you're, you know, you're onboarding um, alternative accommodations. Um, and then one of your uh, focuses, foci, focuses, I'm a journalist, I don't know. I like foci. Um, but, you know. Is you, you want to become more locally relevant. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it's a great buzzword. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. But listen, we have been expanding around the world uh, you know, really around the world for many, many years. Um, but really when we looked at our business, we had not built really leadership positions in most major markets outside of the US, Canada, maybe the UK, Australia. And the reason was essentially, we had never really focused on just getting things right for the Taiwanese customer, or the Japanese customer, or the French customer. Instead, we had been basically expanding all around the world simultaneously. And what locally relevant on a global basis means is that we are focused on a handful of countries. We're going through and we're going to get those nailed. Great content, great translation and localization, perfect payment types. All of the inventory, yes, will be hotel and alternative accommodations, but making sure we have car rentals and activities and all of those things, and making sure that we have brands that are consistently articulating what we stand for in those markets. It's about focus. It's about building something that customers in these countries are going to love. Right. So a couple of years ago, HomeAway and Trivago were going to be the rocket engines of your growth. There's been, been a few curveballs. So yeah. Trivago's had its problems because Booking Holdings, largely because Booking Holdings reduced their advertising spend in Trivago. HomeAway, it seems like that's a, a long haul project. Yeah. Um, you're, you're still in phase one of integrating yeah. HomeAway. You haven't really started international expansion or turning on the marketing spigots. So why is that taking so long? <laughs> 
So just to reset okay. on why that takes I so often long. have to be reset. Uh, yes, I mean, yes. Just, just to clarify, okay. uh, we bought the Craigslist of vacation rentals at the end of 2015. Okay. And today, trailing 12 months of the last quarter, this thing does $11 billion of bookings online. Revenue has basically already doubled. Last quarter, EBITDA had doubled. And customers and hosts love it. So we've done all of that in the last two years. We've got an incredible team there. Uh, they are a rocket ship. But we're also investing for the long term. But we are just in phase one. And phase one was about taking Craigslist and turning it into an e-commerce I'm sure machine. they didn't think of themselves <laughs> as Craigslist. Well, it was a listings business. Yeah. And no, no, I mean, I, like, I still use Craigslist. I like Craigslist. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not disparaging it. Okay. Uh, but it was about taking an offline thing and, and making it online. Um, phase two then is about going into the urban markets where HomeAway VRBO has not traditionally been in the urban markets and really stepping on the gas, gas internationally. Right. So one thing I'm interested in is um, with HomeAway, with alternative accommodation, uh, accommodations, the take rate you have, the amount that you collect from uh, both the host and the consumer yeah is less than the hotel business. So you're ramping up alternative accommodations for the long term. Uh, Booking.com doesn't charge travelers a fee. You do. Airbnb charges much less commissions to the host mm -hmm. of the hotel yep. than you do. So how does this become a sustainable business for you if there's all this demand there, but you're, yeah. you're earning less per, per booking? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, a new booking that's incremental booking is a great booking. Okay. <laughs> so let's start there, which is, you know, right now if you have a family of five who wants to go to, I don't know, Myrtle Beach, we don't have a lot of great alternatives for them on Expedia right now because it's hard. You gotta find two rooms or you gotta pony up for the suite and that's really expensive. Enter HomeAway, VRBO inventory, and now you got the perfect place for them. So whether the commission is X or Y, it doesn't matter. It's incremental, it's new, and our customers absolutely love it. Now, you know, the other thing you raise, which is very interesting, is how do you make your margin? And there is consumer fees, there is supplier fees, and our solution to it is we've got both. So we're able to monetize whatever way the customer is willing to pay or the supplier is willing to pay, and at the end of the day, you know, if you've got the perfect, most beautiful house in Hawaii that everyone wants, how much do you want to pay? Not that much, mm -hmm. because you're going to fill it, everyone loves it, but if you're a customer and you want to book that hotel and it's just one, it's beautiful, how much are you willing to pay? A lot. Yep. It's very different from a situation where you've got a property manager with 100 units in a building and they're all equal and there's a hotel next door. In that case, they're like, yes, I want to fill my hotel, so I'm willing to pay. So our approach has been, let's have a flexible model, and we can adapt it how the marketplace needs. Do you think consumers are going to realize that you know, they can book the thing over on booking.com without a fee? Um, or is the inventory so different? Um, yeah. Well, I think that the type of inventory that was the first to go online you know, on our competitor, a lot of it was professionally managed stuff like the one I spoke about, 100 mm -hmm. units in a building. Um, and in that case, you know, we're going to have essentially the same monetization model as other platforms. Um, but I think again, so the models will change. I think the models are just going to evolve over time. And, right. and remember, only thing is happening here is you say, if you take a customer that says, "Listen, I'll pay two hundred dollars a night," and they're choosing this place versus that place, this is that place. At the end of the day, the they're willing to pay that. The supplier is going to say, "Well, listen, I want at least one seventy-five." So now you got that. Now you got that twenty-five. Whether the supplier pays you or the consumer pays you, in the end, it doesn't matter. Right. So, do you worry though that that incremental booking, be, you know, as alternative accommodations go mainstream, um, dilutes your hotel business? You know, I think we're very focused on making sure that we continue to drive, you know, good results for our for our hotel partners. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, you know, we're a travel agent. <laughs> you know, we're 
in the business travel of... Travel advisor. No, you're a travel agent. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we're in, we're in the business of travel agent. We're just yeah. essentially automating all of the things that a travel agent used to do. And, and just like a travel agent would say, you know, Dennis, where do you want to go? What kind of place are you looking for? If you tell me, I want to stay in a big house, I just got to have that. Mm -hmm. So that's our approach. In the end, we run a big marketplace. We've automated the traditional role of the travel agent, and we've got to have everything. Mergers and acquisitions. If you want to announce any today, we're, we're all ears. <laughs> but one thing I've been thinking Thank about you. is uh, Thomas Cook. So you, yes. have, you have a partnership yeah. with Thomas Cook. Uh, I believe they're using your vacation rental inventory. Um, and I was thinking, hmm, this sounds like the Silver Rail playbook. You partner with them, and then you buy them. <laughs> mm. And then one insider told me, uh, well, no, Tom, I'm, now Tom, I'm curious. What are you going to say? You know, Thomas Cook has yeah. the issue of they have all, all these storefronts and offline agencies, yeah. uh, which you probably wouldn't be too crazy about. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's a, there's a, um, a big cu customer base that you probably don't tap. Yeah. But anyway, the insider told me, yes. not the insider to uh, a, a travel industry wag, told me, you know, Mark's not going to do something like that now because Dara bought all these companies and didn't really execute as well as he could, but Mark is focused on execution. Mm. So, Thomas Cook, are you buying it? And M&A, <laughs> what's your attitude these days? Well, first of all, you do know who was running M&A for the last 12 years at Expedia. Uh, you? <laughs> it's in the DNA. We're always <laughs> going to look at stuff. Right. And, you know, Dara executed brilliantly on those deals, and he is a visionary in so many ways, so I would never say that he didn't execute well. He executed brilliantly for the strategy we're on, and we're going in a new direction because we looked at what we had built and we said, wow, this is an amazing platform that we've got, and let's just operate it like a two-sided platform. Now, whether we need to buy Thomas Cook or any other player to augment some consumer segment that we can't get at, listen, all this stuff is on the table, but our partnership with Thomas Cook is really about us externalizing the technology and essentially the benefits of the platform to an iconic brand who Europeans love. What, what does and externalizing mean? Well, Lending we're, them your yeah, we're providing them yeah. with the technology platform so their agents can basically book on our platform. We're providing them with our, you know, our hotel and all this other inventory that we can provide them. We're providing with API connectivity so they can plug things into their own tools. Um, we just got so many assets across the platform, and we're opening them up to them. Uh, what about Despigar in Latin America? When, I like when, Despigar. When are you going to pull that trigger? <laughs> um, listen, we have a minority position in Despigar, as you know. Um, we're, we're on their board. We've got a great relationship on the supply part of the business. Um, we're also building big businesses in Hotels.com and Expedia in Latin America. And, um, and listen, we will at some point, if the time is perfect and the price is perfect, we would look at it. But we're only going to do something if it's additive to the, to the platform. Um, and, you know, there's, again, we really believe in these global brands that we've got, uh, Expedia and Hotels.com, particularly HomeAway. Uh, so we don't need to buy anything. What about Did Amazon? Did I talk around your question enough? No, it was, it was pretty close. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> what about Amazon and Google? They keep you up at night? Oh, so much keeps me up at night. Yeah. That's my job to okay. be paranoid. So, um, yes, absolutely. You know, the big tech players who uh, have tremendous capabilities, uh, I think about them a lot. But I think, as you, as you mentioned right from the start, I mean, we've been at this for 20 years. We have you know, 6,000 of the brightest product and technical you know, engineers in the industry that work for us. Uh, we've got some of the brightest AI talent and data scientists, uh, certainly in this industry, working at Expedia Group. And we are stepping on the gas. So if we were standing still saying, gee, I've got to protect what I've got, I'd be a lot more worried. But the answer for us is, move faster, be more focused, focus on the customer, because in the end, if you deliver an incredible product to the customer, and you have a platform that your partners get real value from, mm -hmm. and you move fast, you're in a great spot. What about the issue of regulating Google? So the EU is regulating Google. Uh, 
in the shopping arena, uh, people have told me, well, it really hasn't done very much. And now there's all this talk in the, uh, in the U.S. Yeah. that uh, President Trump wants to regulate, regulate Google, Facebook yeah. um, for political bias. Do you think there needs to be more regulation of Google in the U.S.? Well, listen, I think that these big tech platforms, um, you know, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, uh, certainly Amazon, they have tremendous power. And, you know, I think as, as we realize it with our position in the travel industry, with great power comes great responsibility. So I think that provided that these players behave in a way that is befitting of the responsibility to society, I think we'll be fine. But the reality is, is that, you know, in many cases, the, you know, the things that have happened to Facebook, for example, those have not been as a result of, like, misdeed or them trying to break the law is these are just massive businesses with huge network effects and uncontrolled activity that we will just have to you know, take time. And I actually don't think that a, you know, a regulatory mandate is necessarily required for someone like Facebook to start to get the, these things under control because it's in their business interest to do it. This is hard, and so now they're focusing on it. Okay. Um, I think in this chair last year, <clears throat> you said tours and activities needed to be a, a, a higher priority yeah. uh, for Expedia. And now we see you know, Airbnb is doing experiences and TripAdvisor is really growing with Expedia you know, experiences. And Steve Kaufer of TripAdvisor thinks it can be you know, a really gigantic business. Yeah. What kind of priority does it have for Expedia? Uh, it's up there. You know, it's definitely, definitely top 10. But it's um, so competitive now. It yep. is, but listen, this industry is competitive. Mm -hmm. And you know, the reality is, is that there is just so much activities business that is out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a well over a hundred billion dollar segment, a fraction of it is online, and there's a huge amount of opportunity. And, and of course, we're focused on doing what we have structural advantages on. And one of the structural advantages we have is that because we're a full travel agent, like we're not just a traffic arbitrage or hotel only player, you know, we have the ability, we know where people are, they've got our apps installed, and we've got a lot of advantage. Now TripAdvisor has got, I love that business too, by the way, and I think they're gonna do very well on it, but there's, we've seen this, there's room for two, there's room for three, and I think here in the US particularly, you know, people talk about, oh, it's saturated, it's mature, nothing's saturated, nothing's mature. We're like 6% of the travel industry, and Indonesia is coming online, and you know Jap Japan domestic is opening up. There's so much opportunity ahead in activities, and just honestly, in the industry in total. Right. Do you think Meta Search is dead mm. when um, you know one or two players, including yourself, yeah. can make or break a company? Yeah, I don't think it's dead, uh, and here's why. I think that you know as long as you have a number of advertisers that are interested in being in the platform. Uh, as long as you have customers that actually still go to and appreciate the platform. There's a real business there. And that exists right now at Trivago, that exists in TripAdvisor's hotel product, that exists in uh, the Google Hotel Ads product, uh, that exists in you know, Skyscanner to some extent, although they're much more fo uh, flights focused. Customers like it, advertisers are looking for ways to get new customers, and that has real value. now. We were in a situation where the two big global players were basically paying above the market for new customer acquisition on these channels. And you know, our competitor moved down, the auction cooled off, we stepped down with them, and now it's a much more level playing field. And the only thing that's really happened is we've essentially taken some excess industri industry profits that went to some of these platforms and brought them back where they belong, but we're, we're, you know, we're gonna grow from here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Audience questions. How will you maintain profitability as bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger chains mm -hmm. uh, push direct booking? Well, um, we're doing okay right now, and direct booking is a, I know why they're doing it, by the way. I totally, I've been trying to do the same thing. Uh, it hasn't hurt our business. In fact, we're you know, as profitable and growing as nicely as we ever have. So um, I'm not really thinking about them as a competitor. I'm thinking about them as a partner 
we operate a massive platform and there are so many ways that even for the, the biggest of chains, which by the way, the biggest chains has less than 10,000 properties. We've got 750,000 live. In, by the way, in an industry where customers want choice. So we're just in different businesses. Uh, we want to partner with these partners. We want to introduce them to new customers. We want to sign up loyalty members for them. We want to give them technology that we're already using that we could give them for free in many cases, like our Rev Plus product. We think there are so many ways that we can work together, and that's what I'm focused on. Why should a cost-conscious millennial, definitely not like myself, use HomeAway instead of Airbnb? <laughs> Well, I think that's the question. I mean, the, the, that is the question that, that HomeAway VRBO is driving for. Now, there's a, few, uh, there's a few big reasons. I think one, that there's just a difference in the inventory set. And listen, there is some overlap, absolutely. Right. Uh, but there's a difference in the inventory set, generally in the way it skews, which is HomeAway VRBO is generally sort of larger resort like big groups and Airbnb SKUs to smaller shared units. And you know, over time, we're gonna be moving into that shared unit urban space. And then if you're a millennial, heck, why not try something new? If the experience the same, you're open-minded, you're a millennial, try something new. And at the same time, maybe you had an amazing trip that you booked on Expedia and you've got your Expedia rewards con uh, points, because you're cost conscious, everyone loves the points, and now you see that same property that's on Airbnb on Expedia. Mm -hmm. Why would you not book that? It's the same thing, and you get points, and by the way, it's on your app, and you can fly there, it's all there, and while you land, we'll give you an incredible activity that you can do. Sounds awesome. Yeah. I think millennials love it. <laughs> what are you doing with the voice? Has the has the buzz about voice quieted down? Mm. I listen, everything quiets down once it's been around for a while, uh, but the focus and the use case has not. And you know what we've been working on is, is building essentially what we call the conversations platform, which is able to take either written text or spoken text and translate it into actions in an automated way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, a, it's a big area of focus for us. There's absolutely voice applications to it. There's absolutely chatbot applications for it. Uh, we need to do it. Uh, it's going to be important. It's already important in many places. But you got to do it right. You got to build all the, uh, the AI and the automation underneath it. Because at the end of the day, all of the voice commands end up in a human reading them in text. <laughs> And doing something on a computer, right. it's not very scalable. Yep. Really quick, how's uh, Expedia add-on advantage doing where you could tack on a hotel yep. room? It's great. Uh, customers have been loving it. Uh, and um, so it's, it kind of lives up to what the Expedia promises. Like there's a real benefit to getting all of these things together. Not only do you have it all on one app, you know, but also you can get special deals, and we've got partners who, guess what? They also love it. It's hugely targetable. You know the person's flying to the place. You know it's not published, and you can actually fill up your hotel. So it's been great. It's good to see someone doing something different. I'll say that. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Thanks, Dennis. All right. so. You're missing the best part, those people who, who, are walking on, who are walking off. So now starts the next six hours of the conference where Jason and I talk about the last six years of Skift uh, in excruciating detail. Hang me. Uh, no. So thank you, everyone, for sticking around. This ends our fifth annual Skift Global Forum. Thank you all for coming. But there are a few announcements I want to make. You will, receive, we, we, you will be receiving the post-forum survey pretty much oh, tomorrow morning. Um, we really do care, we do take it seriously. I read each of yours, so just if you're giving survey, keep in mind I'll be reading it. So if you wanna hurt us, it's fine, just I will be able to take it. So please put all the surveys in it. We wanna, uh, um, we, we, we improve because of what you give us. One of the feedbacks that you gave us in the last previous years was the second half of the second day we need to fly out. Guess what, we solved it. 
So hopefully you should be, if you need to go later, you should because we just made it a day and a half. Um, you will be getting uh, reminders. So these are our forums, if you can throw it back up there. These are forums for next year. You'll be getting details on that. We will send only the attendees a special rate. So hopefully you should be able to buy. We already sold, I think, a few tickets for our forum, this forum next the year one, already. And the one on the far right is the most important one next oh, year? Oh, yes, because that's what Jason is in charge of. It's really programming is stellar. Skiff Restaurants Forum, if you guys weren't there this Monday, you will be able to go on a, another Monday a year from now. Yes. Um, also, you will get an offer for our world-class world -class Skiff Research. The Skiff Research team does an amazing job. You should be, and they're all sitting right there. Um, you should be, you will get an offer to subscribe to the research. Why wouldn't you? Um, you want to subscribe to, how many, who doesn't subscribe to our newsletter? Nobody, okay. So that, that was a wasted one. Um, okay. <laughs> we, uh, I'm sure you knew we announced a bunch of uh, announcements. I'm going to repeat it. We acquired Airline Weekly. We launched Skiff Wellness. We, so we launched the Skiff Foundation, and we are uh, uh, doing our expansion in Asia. I do want to thank, so let me get into thanks. I want to thank our attendees, our speakers, all of our sponsors. I want to thank all the Skiff staff that makes all of this possible. The events team, especially Elizabeth, Joanne, Regina, Rio, they, they kill it. They, all the stuff that you saw was all of their doing. Um, I want to thank Legends, who's our production company that we use from year one, and they do an incredible job. Please give a hand to all of them. <laughs> all the back of the house jazz staff, you are amazing. Thank you for all the work that, that all of you do. And we're, and we're coming back here next year, too. We are coming back here next year. It's, it's right here. What's the date? 25th, 26th. So that's when we're back. All right, thank you, everyone. Jason.